Welcome to the world of Shetland sheep. I'm Linda of Windy Oaks and today we're going to talk about raising Shetlands and what goes into their care, feeding, and a little bit about their history. Thanks for joining me and I'm glad you're part of the flock. Shetland sheep are called that because they come from the Shetland Islands off the north coast of Scotland. They are originally brought to Shetland by the Vikings. They're what's known as a primitive breed, which means that they have not been altered over much from the way they were on Shetland for hundreds of years. You can see, I hope, Miss Demeter just turned perfectly to see her tail. It is a triangle shape, also known as a fluke shape. It does not get too long and it does not need to be docked or cut in order to keep the sheep healthy. Shetlands came to the United States through Canada. A flock was imported to Canada in 1980 and it moved from there. And now they're raised across the country. They are of course still raised in Shetland and in other parts of the UK and even other parts of the world. They are a very popular breed because they are small and easy for one person to handle. They are very clever and have loads of personality. They give amazing wool that is great for all sorts of fiber arts, uh, knitting, spinning, weaving. They can be horned or pulled. What that means is, like Demeter here, she does not have horns. Uh, but there are some ewes or females that do have horns. My rams, my boys, do have horns, and there are some rams that do not have horns. So it really depends on the breeding line as to whether or not they have horns. Shetland sheep are very hardy. They don't need special feed under most circumstances. They do just fine on grass and grass hay in the winter. So that makes them a great economical sheep that you don't need to pay for extra feed. I do occasionally give them sweet feed, which is a mix of some grains, corn, a little bit of molasses, etc. Uh, that I give them just as a treat. I, I, they get about a handful, maybe once a day, because it brings them into the barn so I can get a head count, lay eyes on everyone, see how everyone's doing. One of the cool things about Shetlands is they're what's called thrifty. It means that they don't need tons of food to put on weight and fleece growth. They do just fine on small acreages and because of their small size and the fact that they grow primarily on grass, they're great for small farms or as the British call it, small holdings. You can usually have about three to an acre, but it depends on your pasture, how good it is, how big it is, how long it has to rest between grazing periods, etc. They do eat hay in the winter, which is essentially just dried grass. So you do have to be aware of that. We typically feed from October or November, depending on, on the weather and the pasture, through to about April. Shetlands also like to browse. The difference is grazing is all head down, browsing is head up, which means that they will eat things like trees, bushes, and things other than just grass. So you do need to make sure that if you have any trees you want to survive, that they're fenced off. One of the neat things about Shetlands is they actually have multiple wool types all on the same sheep. So I don't know if you can see, Miss Demeter is being a very helpful uh, demonstration, but here on her hind legs, the fleece is not as fine and crimpy as up on her neck. So you can get multiple different products from one fleece. The neck fleece is always the finest and the hind fleece or rump fleece is the roughest. And the in between here, the blanket, is usually medium between the two and it's very soft and very fun to spin and very bouncy. Some Shetland sheep, not most of mine, but some of them, actually will root, R-O-O. This means they will naturally shed their fleece and you can take the fleece off without having to cut it at shearing. However, I get mine sheared just because it's easier, faster, and can happen all at the same time. 
Shetlands are also better at resisting parasites like homunculus or barber pole worm. This means that we don't have to worm them as often, so the worms don't build up a tolerance for the dewormers that we use, which is a problem in most places that raise sheep. By having to deworm less frequently, less of the deworming chemicals get into the soil, get into the parasites, and you have fewer mutations of the parasites that become parasite resistant. I do always have good quality sheep minerals and baking soda out free choice. What that means is I have bowls of minerals and baking soda out for them to eat whenever they want. The sheep minerals include things like selenium that are deficient in our soil that they need for healthy growth and development. The baking soda helps them regulate their stomach, their rumens because they can get something called bloat, which causes gas in the rumen and can actually kill a sheep. So the baking soda helps regulate that and keep bloat from happening. They also do need to get a shot once a year. That's a vaccine. It's called CDT, Charlie Delta Tango. I'll put it up on the screen what that stands for. It helps keep them safe from overeating disease, tetanus, and other issues and I usually give that to them during shearing so that they just get handled once a year, don't have any muss or fuss. If they need their toes done, I will do their toes at shearing time as well. One of the nice things about them being out on pasture all the time is their hooves get worn down as they walk around and graze and do their thing. Even though Shetlands are very easy keepers, you want to have a good vet. A veterinarian can make the difference between life or death when something does go wrong, as it will occasionally. You need to have someone that you can call for advice or to come out to your farm if there's a problem. Demeter here actually needed help from the vet with her last lambing because Miss Bonnie had her leg turned back instead of forward as it should have been for lambing. Our vet came out, managed to pull the lamb and save her life. One way to tell if it is time to call the vet is if a sheep has stopped eating. They don't show illness very easily because they are prey animals. So of course they're not going to show being weaker and firm. So you've got to look for subtle signs that there are a problem. Being lethargic, not chewing their cud, not eating treats that they would climb over you for any other day. So just keep an eye out and you can always check with your mentor or your vet to see if they might need to come out. Although Shetlands prefer to be out in the weather during pretty much any weather, they do need a good shelter. It doesn't have to be fancy. It can be a run-in shed like we have for the rams up front, or it can be a fancy barn whatever you like, just as long as they have somewhere to get out of the rain, snow, and wind as necessary. Once a year, the Shetlands need to get sheared. It is critical that sheep get sheared at least once a year. If they don't get sheared, they can overheat in the summer. They can have the fleece actually felt on them and it will inhibit their, their motion so they can't walk or can't eat. It will encourage disease and injuries like lesions on the skin from where it rubs too much or something called fly strike where a fly will lay its eggs in the fleece itself and the eggs will eat the skin off the sheep. It's pretty gross, I know, but that's one of the reasons we shear every year. It does not hurt the animals. It's just like getting a haircut. Uh, there are occasional nicks because just like a two-year-old that doesn't want to get a haircut, sometimes they struggle and the sheep feel much better in the early summer when the fleece comes off. When it comes to shearing, I hire in. I like hiring someone who knows what they're doing, can do it quickly, and will do a good job that will give me a spinner's fleece. When you're shearing a meat sheep that is also a wool sheep, you don't necessarily need to be careful about how the fleece comes off. But when you're shearing for spinning, for hand spinning especially, you need to avoid something called second cuts. That's where you, you cut a lock down and then cut it again to get the bottom part off. 
You want to avoid second cuts. You want to keep the fleece in as much of one piece as possible, uh, as a lot of people like to buy a whole fleece. Once the fleece is off the animal, it gets skirted, which means you take off the poopy and mucky bits, you take out any of the dirt that you can, and you are left with only the best parts of the fiber. You throw away any second cuts, anything that's uh, just not great, like a lot of the wool from the legs is very felted, and that will just get thrown away when she's sheared. After that, the fiber is washed, dried, and spun into yarn, or used for felting projects. One of the neat things about them is Shetlands are seasonal breeders, which means they're only able to get pregnant during a certain part of the year. It's triggered by light, not temperature, so it's triggered by the number of hours of daylight, a lot like a, a laying hen and a chicken. But that's a general rule, especially for a, a younger sheep, Sometimes the cycles aren't exact, uh, or if the, uh, you're blocking my shot. A lot of people actually run their rams with their ewes all year long. I don't, I separate my boys. It just makes life a lot easier for me. But there are not a lot of what you call oops lambs with Shetlands because their, their cycle is pretty much tied to a certain period in the year. Most of the time they'll have either a single lamb or they'll have twins. Triplets are not unheard of, but they're not common either. They're what's considered very milky. So most of the time the lambs have plenty to drink. Sometimes if you have a triplet, you might need to supplement the triplet to make sure that they're getting enough milk. But for the most part, it, you can let the sheep be the mom and not worry too much about raising a bottle lamb every year. One of the things you can do to affect your lamb production is called flushing. What that means is you increase the plane of nutrition, you increase the amount of nutrition the sheep gets before breeding and then again before lambing. The additional feed helps give them the energy and the nutrients they need and the more nutrients they have, the more their bodies are able to carry twins, or sometimes even triplets. One of the things that I wish I knew when I first got sheep was that lambing is something that you really should plan for. I just thought, you get sheep, you have to lamb. It's, it's part of raising sheep. Well, that's not true. We're really full up here on our paddocks. We don't have the room to support another dozen or more sheep. And I don't like sending my sheep out to an auction or to uh, people that I don't know because I've had bad experiences with selling to people that haven't taken proper care of them. So I am not currently breeding. And you know what? That's okay. I don't have to have lambs every year, no matter how cute they are. So be very intentional with your breeding. That's something that I didn't know at the time. Talking about raising sheep for meat is a tough subject, especially since today most people don't know where their food comes from. It comes in a little white plastic wrapped package from the grocery store. Well, I decided that since I am a meat eater, I would like to take responsibility for where my meat comes from. Part of that is raising my own, and part of that is buying from other small farmers whose practices I know. And unfortunately, one of the truths about raising sheep is that if you want to have a healthy herd going towards your goals, your fiber goals, your conformation goals, your health goals, not every animal is going to make the cut, which means that you need to do something with the ones that don't. And normally we call them. Now call, C-U-L-L, -L, can mean just we stop breeding them or it can mean we send them off to the butcher. It's not an easy thing to do. I wanna say that up front. But I do find that I value my food more when I know where it came from and I do not waste it. I also know the life that these animals led and I know the abattoir that we send our animals to. Sending sheep to the butcher is not an easy thing to do. And personally, I think that's good. I don't want to take for granted that the meat that I've chosen to eat was once a live creature. That might sound a little weird, 
but to me it reminds me to be respectful of the animal to not waste the meat and to make sure that I know the circumstances in which my meat was raised. Now one of the good things about raising Shetland sheep for meat is that their meat is quite frankly delicious. Not a lot of Americans eat sheep these days, which I think is a real miss on the part of most people. Sheep has a unique taste in and of itself and Shetland and other heritage breed sheep have very flavorful, well-textured meat. Shetlands are smaller and you don't get as much meat as you would with a purpose-bred meat sheep, like a Katahdin, but you do get other things like their wool and like some really exquisite flavor. Shetlands can often have a somewhat strong flavor for people who are not used to eating sheep, especially if it comes from a ram. So you need to be careful about when you butcher your rams so that they're not coming into or just coming out of breeding season so that they won't have that heavy ram taint. The rams are going into, through, and out of breeding season. Those hormones are very strong. So if you wait until early summer, you're not going to have that issue. One of the things I love about Shetlands is their personalities. They are characters. Demeter will stand for hours to get snuggles. A leg right here tries to climb me like a tree when I have peanuts. We have Bonnie who is shy. We have Iris who is patient. We have April who is curious. They all have their own personalities. But you have to be aware of how to handle them. With ewes, you can let them come up and snuggle as much as you like. But when it comes to rams, when it comes to the boys, you need to be a little bit more careful. You don't want to encourage them to disrespect you or push or in any way think of you as a sheep that they can dominate because they're rams. It's in their hormones to try and be the top ram. And if you handle rams improperly, they can start to think that they can push you around, they'll headbutt you uh, or otherwise try and be top sheep over you in which case you can really get injured very badly. I will say anyone that does that here on this farm goes right to freezer camp because we do not tolerate that kind of behavior. And I actually have rams that if I am doing something in the paddock, I will turn my back on them to do that. Now, I am very careful still. I'm always aware of my surroundings. For instance, I would never wear headphones when I'm out in the barn or in the rams paddock, but I know that they are not going to get so pushy with me because I'm very careful with how I interact with them. When I'm giving affection to the rams, all I do is I scratch their chest like this or their chin. Never on top of the head, which will encourage headbutting. And I don't tend to handle their back a lot just because I give them love. And one of the things is when I am done petting a ram, I'm done. He doesn't get to say he wants more attention. So it's just keeping proper boundaries in place when you're dealing with a ram. You have to be aware that you're dealing with animals that have their own priorities, instincts, and genetics and hormones that drive certain behaviors. It's not that they are good, bad, or indifferent, it's just part of who they are. And it is irresponsible to not be aware of that and not take proper precautions, especially when dealing with an intact male sheep. Now that's not to say that there aren't sweet sheep. My castor bean is a lovely sheep. Castor, stop that. Hey, Kaz, Kaz, excuse me, Brew. Do not headbutt my camera. Thank you. Good gravy, sheep. And I love giving him scritches and treats and bananas because he goes crazy for bananas. But I'm also very careful to remember that he's a ram and therefore there are some boundaries that I can't let him cross or it will become dangerous for both of us. Some other important things to know. You have to have at least three sheep for them to be happy and healthy mentally. Sheep are flock animals. They are herd animals. They do not do well by themselves. In fact, uh, it can greatly damage their mental health if they are alone. So please make sure that you always have at least three sheep so that they can have a herd mentality. 
find a mentor. Mentors are worth their weight in gold. And I know that's really hard to do. It's really intimidating to think, how do I find a mentor? Well, there are some great places you can find a mentor. First, there are two US-based organizations that are very good. The first is NASA, the North American Shetland Sheep Association. And the second is the Fine Fleece Shetland Association. Both have tons of information and are great organizations that do a lot for the breed. There's also at least one organization in the UK, the Shetland Sheep Society. On Facebook, there's the Shetland Sheep Group. There are so many wonderful people there who have been of great assistance to me, helping me with questions and camaraderie and friendship. Love that group. I'm so glad you joined me and the flock for this exploration into Shetland sheep. They are a joy to have and they are a great sheep for a fiber artist because their fleece is just magnificent. It's my very favorite to spin. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments and I'll do my best to answer. Don't forget to hit like and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.